Tempted and tried, you the word became flesh for my sin in death. Now you're
seated. Good morning, everybody. Glad you could get here. <coughs> Things are, well, they're like they sh are supposed to be, I guess, in Wyoming, but um, it's kind of cold. <coughs> we are Th looking already um, at Wednesday. I don't know what we'll do Wednesday. Um, it's going to snow, I guess, some more. But it, the high is about four below zero. That's the high. And then it's going to be further below in the evening. So uh, I don't know. When you get to be really old, you know, ancient like I am, um, and you think, I'd like to just start a fire in the fireplace and stay home. You know what I mean? That's not very religious, but I may not even be a Christian. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, <coughs> Scripture. Um, if you want to go ahead and find uh, John, the Gospel of John 16, chapter 16. I want to just give you a little bit of background for this, <coughs> this scripture. Um, <coughs> there is something called the Upper Room Discourse, okay? And this was the period of time preparing for and then celebrating the Passover Supper in the Upper Room in Jerusalem. Jesus gathered there with his disciples. And it really starts in the 13th chapter, and there's where we have the um, washing of the disciples' feet by the Lord. And we have <coughs> um, the teaching on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And 
the position I want us to try to imagine being in as we look at some of the scripture. It's 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Ends with 17, the, the high pre, uh, priestly prayer. Um, Jesus is trying his best, but the disciples are human and understandably so. They had walked with him for three years and watched him raise the dead and heal the blind, walk on water, feed the 5,000 with nothing, hardly, and multiply it. They had seen all of this. And now, and he didn't fail to tell them what the end was going to be. He kept telling them, um, I will be given over into the hands of evil people and they will crucify me, but I will rise from the dead the third day. That whole piece of the puzzle Jesus talked to them a lot about. They never heard it. Um, somehow they missed it. Now he is in the scripture we'll read and starting with th chapter 13, but in 16 that we'll read, they're half a day, they're 12 hours from Jesus being put through a sham fake trial, um, hauled out of the city, scourged, beaten and hauled out, made to carry his own cross and nailed to a cross. And he knew they were going to have doubts. 16 verse 1 which we don't, I'll just introduce it to you. Or just, he just said, I'm telling you all these things, and plus the previous things in 13 and 14 and 15. I'm telling you all these things so you won't fall away. That tells us a couple things. I can fall away. Um, several versions are use different words. I think the New American Standard, I'm reading from, we'll be reading from the e English Standard Version. New American Standard Bible is a little too soft. It says, I'm saying these things to you so you won't stumble. It's not what it says. It's not just stumbling, it's falling away. Second, not only does it tell us that we can walk away from the faith, but it tells us that Jesus knew they would be pressed to the limit. Falling away, walking away from truth, giving up hope, losing faith, was a very real peril for these disciples because of what they would witness. It was totally from in, impossible for them to imagine how far away this was from their expectations. They still retained the notion that Jesus would reveal himself to the nation of Israel as a king. He would throw off the yoke of the Romans and they would get their country back. They'd get their sovereignty back. And th that, that was the low ceiling view that they all the Jews had. He's going to get us away, get the lousy Romans off our neck. They didn't see anything spiritual. They were just focused on the flesh, the, the physical, what I can see, count, measure. They didn't see any further. So Jesus knew when they experience my death on a cross, and they'll interpret that as utter loss and failure, I'm going to say some things to them to keep them from falling away. Now, in 16, uh, obviously, we can't read the other chapters ahead of it, but in the 16th verse, as he is drawing his teaching to a close and get read, getting ready to pray in 17, the high priestly prayer Meanwhile, by the way, as be best we can tell, beginning at the end of chapter 14, they leave the upper room where they've been 
eating the Passover supper. They are now walking on their way through the streets, apparently, of Jerusalem, heading toward the Mount of Olives, which was east of the city, big valley in between. And on that mount was the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was to pray. And it was also where he knew, the disciples didn't, but he knew, I'll be arrested. Um, a whole group, a mob of the temple officers would, will arrest me there. And so they are walking, apparently, while Jesus is teaching them, um, especially 15 and 16. In 1616, then, Jesus says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us, quote, A little while, and you'll see, not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. And what does he mean by, Because I am going to the Father? So they were saying, What does he mean by, quote, a little while. We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you were asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, quote, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your, jo your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I've said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? This sentence expects a negative answer. In other words, Jesus wasn't being unkind to them. He was being kind. Yet he knew within probably an hour, they'll scatter from me. Some of them will even say they don't even know who I am. And they stand in front of him now saying, we believe you. Do you really believe? He's saying, interestingly, a couple of chapters earlier in this same book, you have Peter saying to Jesus, I will even go to death for you because Jesus had earlier said, you will separate from me. You will run away from me and deny you know me. And Peter rebuked Jesus and said, oh, that's not true. You don't know what you're talking about. He said, I don't know about the rest of these guys, but he said, I will follow you even unto death. And the Jesus had the same kind of sentence that he has here. He says, will you really follow me, follow me to death? Expecting in his heart, he knew, no, you won't. He wasn't accusing Peter then and the disciples here of, of intentional deceit, lying, but he was just letting them know kindly. You don't realize what you're up against. You don't realize how severe the trial will be. You don't, you don't recognize the battle that we're in. 
it's similar to one other um, illustration when James and John went and got their mom and had their mom come to Jesus and plead the case that James and John need to sit on either side of the throne. Um, you know, I vote with the other disciples when they're irritated <laughs> over that. But Jesus, in the same way, when Mary, their mother, came and said, would you let my sons be, you know, on either side of your throne at the expense of all the other disciples, Jesus said to them, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? You know what their answer was? Yes. But he knew, no, you're not. Um, so it's that kind of a question. He, he's kind to them. He understands that they mean as far as they know that they believe in him, but he says, you, do, you don't really get it yet. So, behold, he says, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come already. Now It's here now. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Those, that, those three, kind of three statements out of that 33rd verse are the ones that I want to look at here for the time that we have. Christians, as Christians, we can expect at least three things. We can expect to encounter at least three things in this world. And Jesus touches on them here. First, <clears throat> there is a significant contrast in our lives, in the world in which we move and live and spend our whole lives, there is a significant contrast. We actually live in dual worlds. As Christians, of course, at like any other human being, we inhabit a physical world. We can see, touch, count, record things. We live in a physical world. But also, everyone else, many who don't recognize it, but everyone else also lives in a spiritual world. Now, that spiritual world is divided in two. We all share the physical but the spiritual world, in that sense and in that world, we live in two radically different worlds. I can't even describe how radically different they are. The contrast is between the world that is molded by and under the dominion of Satan who is a real being. He is not a figment of old ladies' imaginations and little kids. Satan is as real as God is. God is the one who gives us the information on Satan, so we know it's accurate. He is spoken of as a person, a being. He has um, attributes, qualities of character attributed to him as are attributed to a real person. Thinking, willing, choosing meaning. Acting in all kinds of ways. Deceiving, lying. He is a true, real, actual being. And let me tell you who he loves the most. He loves the most those who joke about and are dismissive of his existence. He loves that. 
when we don't even, even acknowledge that he is a real being locked in mortal combat with God himself. When we deny that, treat him as a figment of fevered imaginations, childlike fantasies and superstitions, he loves it. Then he can do his work without anyone even uh, asking if maybe that's where this influence, this habit, this oppression, this whatever is really coming from. He loves that. When we explain his deeds as coincidence, as accident, as figments of imagination. What are the contrasts that we face in this world? Well, <clears throat> we just have to look at it this way. It's a world of light versus a world of darkness. It's a world of love versus a world of hatred. For instance, Jesus touches on that. He said, referring to his very soon crucifixion, he said, you will sorrow and you will lament, but the world will rejoice. How stark a difference is that? At Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went about doing good, is hanging on a cross with a jeering mob at the foot, laughing at him. He said, you'll cry. You'll be brokenhearted. They'll be running the streets in happiness. What a contrast that is. The world, so listen, the world doesn't like Jesus. Even when they give him compliments, like the world will give him. Oh, he was a wonderful teacher. What a wonderful example of social justice that Jesus was. But notice, they always stop short. Always stop short of him being God. Who was put on a cross, but who rose from the dead. They don't go there. It wasn't too long ago I was in a store, I can't even remember where, some department store, um, Christmas time. And there, there used to be, I haven't heard for some time now, but there used to be some kind of little story, I can't, I don't know what you'd call it, um, but it, on the life of Jesus. How he made, you know, whole armies marched, navies sailed, whole countries went different ways because of this, the man from Galilee. It keeps talking about the man from Galilee. And he taught and he did this and he healed and he helped and, you know, whatever. And then it ends. It continues on about how many people follow his name and this and that. But it, it, it just ends. It never says and men rose up, put him on a cross, put him to death, but he rose to, he rose to live forever in heaven today. And his spirit fills this earth. They never said that. Why? Because we prefer a tamed, uh, trimmed down Jesus. The good teacher Jesus the great leader, Jesus, or of some people who don't know up from down. Jesus was a, he was a revolutionary. Anybody who says that is documentably nuts. Okay? Jesus, no one said as much as Jesus did, I came here to fulfill the law, to teach you to walk after my Father's will saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't obey me? 
Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's not revolutionary. He came as a Savior to save us from the slavery to sin, which blinds us so that we think like that. The contrast, then, is as wide as we could possibly try to explain humanly. This is the world we live in. It's a twofold world spiritually, and it is as black as black can be and as light as light can be. John, this same author, in his first letter, said this, God is light, and in him is no darkness. Now, the original language is even stronger than that. It's God is light, and in him is no darkness, none at all. That's the world Christians walk in. And we will notice sharp contrast with the other world, the world of hatred and wickedness and filthiness. We see contrast. Second, where you have that kind of contrast, inevitably you will have the second thing, which is conflict. We are at war with that other world in the spiritual realm and to some degree in the physical too. Those two worlds, the world Satan presides over and the kingdom of Christ over which he reigns are locked in deadly combat. And this isn't just a little tiff, a little spat, some disagreement. This, this is for life and death on both sides. God means to absolutely crush Satan, and he has already. The devil means to be God. What little hints we have in Scripture about the aspirations of the devil. What in the world got into him? His attributed statements to him. I will be God. So he's trying to unseat God. It's not working out real well for him. The future does not look very promising for his aspirations. Okay? <clears throat> God is the king of the universe. He is probably one of the most frequently used phrase of God. And I like this. Um, we, none of us should ever think that God is kind of a limp-wristed. You know what I mean? We have this notion about Jesus often. You know, he just went around doing good and he was such a nice person boy. Listen. Every time you read in the Scripture, and you may not know what the word means, but everywhere in Scripture, He is the Lord God of hosts. The God of hosts. The, the Lord of hosts. What is that? It's the God of the army. God's a, he's a five-star at least. He's a general. And he leads out the army. What does that say about us? That says the same thing Paul said to Timothy. We're soldiers. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Don't get entangled in this life's nonsense. Because God's called us to be soldiers. And any of us, or you have loved ones, who are in the service, they don't go tell the base commander, I got some, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run home, be gone for three or four days, maybe a week, I don't know. You wanna try that? <laughs> it won't work too well for you because you're not your own. And they make that very clear. You don't say, 
when you leave, where you go, what you do, when you get up in the morning, when you go to sleep, when you eat, that's none of your affair. We tell you. Well, if God is the God of the army, then we are soldiers in His army. We're in then, we're in a battle. I don't know how much, just to be honest with you, I'm not here as some towering, you know, famous saint telling you ne'er-do-wells, you need to shape up. All of us, all of us live in such affluence and generally such ease, at least in that physical world. The only place usually that we have trouble is in the spiritual world. Oppression of our hearts, depression, discouragement, we think unanswered prayers, the, the, the things that we deal with there. But we escape most of the earthly wants. I told this, the service this morning, you know, I had to, just to make sure it would work, um, I had to go to the garage door from the house out into the garage. And I opened that door and I had to use, and I've got some of those little dry, dry skin cracks you get, you know, that start bleeding when you're trying to button your shirt and that kind of stuff. I even have one right here, and it hurt when I pushed the button to start my truck in the driveway. You understand what I mean? And then I stand up here and tell you, we're in a battle, folks. Well, we are. The problem is we don't recognize it as much as those scattered around this earth who are persecuted for their faith have to sneak a few people in to read the Scripture, which you're not allowed to have, and they hide it someplace under the floorboards of the house. We don't live like that. So it sounds sometimes kind of hollow for us to say, boy, we're in a battle. But we are. It, for us, it's just mostly spiritual rather than I don't have to hide yet to go to church and so forth. I can freely come here. But we're in a warfare. with It's a spiritual warfare. And it is universal. The devil is doing his best to damn my soul and your soul. God is doing his best to save us and to preserve us and get us to heaven. That's why Jesus told the disciples here, I'm saying this to you so you don't fall away. There is a persistent, ongoing war. And here's the war. It is on a couple levels. Obviously, there's, it's a universal war. It's an ongoing world war. But then it's individual. It is individual in the sense that every one of our hearts are the battlefield that the devil and God strive over. God meets Satan head on. I don't know all of the, We know that there are angels on both sides. And the word angel doesn't mean good or bad. The devil and his angels, Jesus spoke of. His followers, spirit followers. We are locked in battle with them. So it's a universal war. But the war that really matters is the battle over my heart. And I, I'm, I'm finishing up the third of a trilogy of the Pacific War. Interesting, interesting book. And we talk about World War II. That's big. Then you break it down. There's the European theater and there's the Pacific theater. Then the Pacific theater gets broken down. There's the South Pacific, the Mid-Pacific, and then there is Japanese homeland, okay? 
And then within all of those different locations, there is all the name Guadalcanal in the south. There's the Marianas in the mid. There's Iwo Jima up further north. And those become the names of plots of dirt, little islands. And every single one of those takes on a life of its own that is, yes, a part of a bigger one, but they're so critical. If they don't get that little island, then the big war <laughs> is threatened. In the same way, every one of us in here represent a named battlefield I don't know how many of you've ever had it, it's a, to me it was a privilege but a solemn and a sobering experience to walk through spend a day at Gettysburg a place of just unbelievable slaughter and all of these little battles within the big battle that turned the tide you stand there and you read about the wheat field. Well, you know, I don't know what we think of when we say wheat field. But looking at the wheat field, standing there and reading all that, and seeing how many people died, it says they literally couldn't walk on the ground without stepping on a body. It's been a long time since I was there. But if I try to, I don't think the wheat field was much bigger than this sanctuary. I mean, you think of a wheat field as a Montana wheat field. It's not that, not that at all. There was, then there was a, a place called um, the Peach Orchard, smaller than this sanctuary. Hundreds and hundreds of people died on that little battlefield. Then there's Big Round Top and Little Round Top, which were crucial battles. And the tide would have gone either way as to who got there first, who won, who had more men, who had better firepower, and who could push the others back. And so we, we recognize that within the big battle, there are hundreds of little tiny battles that are absolutely critical. It's the same thing with us. Every one of us here, there is, there's a little battleground, and it's got your name on it got my name on it and tremendous forces supernatural foes fight over that battlefield with my name on it and the difficult to grasp awkwardness I guess of it and this the strangeness of that battle is that those battles I mentioned at Gettysburg all fell, all were won by the strongest, who had the most firepower, who had the most soldiers. So power won every case. Power and timing. But in this strange battle that has my name on it, it's not wheat field, it's not peach orchard, it's Dan Morgan. You understand? And put your name on it. In that battle, the most powerful doesn't win. Otherwise, God would win every time. The odd thing is, the little field over which the battle is fought chooses who wins. And Jesus made it clear that the vast majority choose to die. Choose Satan to have his way on this battlefield. That's what really makes this a supernatural battle. One, the influence of God tugging at our hearts. And the subtle deceit of the enemy contradicting God. Don't follow him. Wreck your life. Take all your money. Rob you of all your fun. Find out what you don't want to do and then make you do it. 
send you to die on some mission field in the darkest jungles of who knows where. That's the kind of God He is. Thinking about the last song that we sang this morning, and it talks about advertising our God, what our God was like, and behold Him. What a God we have that we can invite people to inspect. We don't have to explain away God. We don't have to be embarrassed of our God. We can say, look at our God. What God's like Him. But in spite of that, the little named battlefield, I get to decide who wins. I can stop God. The Israelites, it said, it says, in the wilderness, they turned back and limited the Holy One of Israel. Because why? Only because of this. Not because of our power. We have more power than God. But He created us and gave us a choice. The power to choose. And He will not trample that. He won't do it. He gave us that right and that ability to choose. And He will never choke it. He will never smother it. Steamroller it. He'll never do that. Finally, with grief in his heart, Jesus will give us our way and he will leave. He will give this little battlefield over to the one I've chosen. I want to win. We are in then a desperate, deadly struggle, conflict. And it's for eternity's sake. It's for where we spend eternity. Now finally, we have, not only do we see a contrast in this world, and we're locked in a deadly contest, conflict, but there is a spiritual conquest. God wins. Here's the thing about this battle. Provisionally, it's already been won. Because Jesus said, I've overcome the world. I have allowed this world to put me to death. And he makes it clear. He makes it very clear. He said, no one takes away my life. He said, I lay it down of my own accord. And he says, I take it up. He voluntarily let the enemy think he triumphed. I don't know. I don't have any idea what kind of keggers they had in hell when Jesus was taken down off the cross and laid in a tomb. Oh, I imagine they really had a great old time. But you know what? It came to a screeching, abrupt halt. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, I have in my hand the keys to death and to hell. So the devil in a literal, eternal act of arrogant stupidity. Let Jesus come into his fortress of death and hell. And Jesus wrecked it. Destroyed it. So that today, I can have the same victory that Jesus bought and retains over Satan. He said, don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. Take heart. I have defeated this world that is pressing against you and seeking to take away your soul. 
I already beat that. So the foe that we face is already beaten. He's already beaten. Who puts money, who puts money on, say, a sports event or whatever, when somehow you already know the final score? Who goes down and says, I, I'm putting whatever, put it on whatever. And you, you have no, they already lost. The game's over. It's like the poor deluded souls down here, or whatever, it used to be attitudes. You know, where people go in there and bet in the horses, Wyoming Downs. You know, you got Churchill Downs, you've got the Queen, you know, and all of her ritzy horse stuff, and we got one down here by the gas station. You know, Wyoming Downs. Nuts. It'd be like going down there, knowing that number eight came in dead last, and you walk in and you take your paycheck Put it, put it on eight. I'm a brilliant, I'm a strategist. I do my research. Put it on eight. You're a moron. So I listen to the devil. Mom, not going to give God my heart. Are we nuts? Yeah. Sin is nuts. Sin is spiritual insanity. Thorough. God said, look, we're in locked in a tough battle. It's going to be tribulation, and the word tribulation means to be crushed. It refers to an instrument that is rolled over wheat, and it crushes it. So we are facing all the time, crushing, crushing events in our lives, crushing grief at times, crushing reverses and setbacks and surprises diagnosis we never had a thought we'd hear we're in a battle but jesus said but i won i've already won it i've overcome it you have a toothless foe we have to remember that a lot of bluster but it whistles through where there ain't no teeth the the devil doesn't have any teeth left he's beaten God help us then to take heart. And he says here too, in this present tense, he said, in me you have peace. And the word literally means, in me you keep having peace. Because of Jesus and hiding in him by faith, we have the victory. Let's bow our heads. And I want us to just do our best to let, as Jesus said, he said, let these words sink down into your ears. That's a good statement. Let this sink down. Yes, we see a stark difference. Yes, we experience conflict. But there's also conquest. Jesus won. So we can. Father in heaven, as we sit in this room this morning in the quiet of the sanctuary, as a storm rages outside, literally, and it's not just the weather, Lord, politically, financially, employment, health, family, spiritual issues, the storm rages. And as we sit in the quiet of the sanctuary, we know that, Lord. We know that if we could stay here on this mountaintop, we would. We would be like Peter and say, let's build a shelter here, Lord, so we don't have to go back down into the valley again. But you tell us, and you recognize, and you feel for us, Lord, in a way, because you tell us that we will weep, and we will lament, 
we will be sorrowful, but take heart. You have overcome. And that idea of taking heart, that word, that statement, Lord, means to take courage. So I pray as we sit in here in the quiet of this room that you build our courage by faith. That you help us to remember this week as we go out of here when we have sorrow and we weep and we lament and we begin to forget, Lord, what we've learned here this morning because we are human. But you promise through your Holy Spirit that you will remind us of all the things that the Holy Spirit of God will remind us of all the things that Jesus has taught us and you have taught us here this morning to remember to take heart, to take courage in the midst of our sorrow, in the midst of our laments, in the midst of our weeping, it will turn to joy. That joy is not just in heaven, yes, to land safely on heaven's shores, but that joy is to experience our Savior in the midst of what we're going through at the moment we're going through it. In the horizontal, Lord, help us to keep it in a vertical perspective in what we're experiencing here on earth, knowing that it's temporal. But knowing more than that, Lord, yes, it's temporary, but you're in it with us. You're walking through whatever we're going through with us. That's where we can take heart. That's where we can take courage. That's where we know our sorrow turns to joy in the moment that we realize that you're with us. Lord, that's good news. Now help us to walk out of this place in the midst of the storms that go on in life and be ready to share a reason for the hope that lies within us, to be a light in a dark place and do all that we do by your grace to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love you guys, you're dismissed. Have a great day, everyone.